Good morning. How are you? I, my name is Peter. I am glad to be here today. I need to tell you, and I'm excited to tell you, um, that um, the welcome that we have received uh, is, is it's truly welcoming. And uh, so we're, we're tickled pink to be here. Um, this church is, is a significant church in my life and in my family's life, and I won't go too far into it, but uh, once upon a time, my wife and my family, myself, left a beloved church in Manitoba, and we ended up in Regina, and we came to this church, and uh, we were sad to leave that church, and we experienced the healing breeze of the Holy Spirit in this church. You also need to know, or I get to tell you, that in the... Uh, early and mid-70s. My parents attended this church, uh, actually uh, Woodward, which was the, uh, the, the church that this church comes from. And they attended, and you can be sure my mom and dad are watching right now. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. Uh, I hope you're well. They live in Calgary. So not only am I glad to be here, but in a certain way, it, 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 it's very comfortable to be here. We also had people welcoming us when uh, our name was announced last week. Uh, we had people Facebooking us and texting us and just saying welcome, and we're coming to a good place. So thank you for that. Uh, know that people speak well of you when you're not listening. It's been fun candidating. Uh, there are many different portions of candidating. It, it feels a little bit like dating. It does. In a little bit of a kind of a way, normally, like, Mandy is way prettier than, than the board. I'm just telling you. Just telling you. But it, it had some similarities. And uh, you need to know that it, it's pretty serious. We're going steady. There's, uh, there's nobody else. We discussed that. But we're not married yet. You know that. I'm talking about the church and I, not Mandy and I. We are married. We, some of you were at that marriage. I promise we're married. We got a video. We'll show it to you later. But it's, uh, it's pretty serious. And the dating that Mandy and I did feels a little similar to candidating. The very first thing that I did is I went out for coffee with one of the board members. And I said, is it an official coffee or is it an unofficial coffee? And he said, it's an unofficial coffee. I said, I'm good at unofficial coffees. Let's go have one. And so we talked. That unofficial coffee became an unofficial coffee. And we talked some more. And it was similar to when Mandy and I started dating. It took me some time to get her to say yes to dating me. In fact, on our first date, she didn't know we were dating. I was certain. But she didn't know and I didn't tell her because she might leave. As we began to date a little bit more seriously, we began to learn things about each other that are really fun things. We learned that we both had similar musical tastes in certain areas. And then there were other areas where our tastes were not similar. I didn't know the stuff that she listened to and she didn't know the stuff that I listened to and we were able to introduce that to each other. She came from a farm in Manitoba. When I was a kid, I read a book about a farm. We had that in common. It was love at first sight. She grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in a Christian home. She has mostly sisters. I have entirely just sisters. There were some similarities, and these were fun things. And as we dated, we learned this stuff about each other. It was exciting. It was a good time. We dated some more, and we began to discuss things that were a little bit more personal. We, start, we started to talk about scars. Anybody here have any scars? I have some scars. I got a really good one, top of my head, right here. You come up afterwards, I'll even let you feel it. <laughs> when I was a kid, get your jokes ready, my uncle was cutting the lawn, and he pushed the swing set back to cut underneath the leg of it, and he let go of the swing set, and it fell and hit me in the head. 90% of you just thought of the same joke right there. I got uh, right here, when my, when, the, uh, when my skin is tanned, my thumb does not tan as darkly as the rest of my hand. I had a cooking oil splashed on my thumb one time. It's, a, it's an interesting scar. 
I've got one on my chest where I was climbing down the side of a fence and there was a nail sticking out. I've got, uh, I've got uh, little scars where things have been removed from, uh, from my face, some moles, that kind of stuff. There's all kinds of scars. My wife would ask me about these scars, and if there's one thing I was absolutely certain of, it's that girls dig scars. <laughs> you know how I know that? Because Scott and I decided that when we were like 12 or 13, and we were trying to figure out how does one girl... How do you do that? And we decided scars. That's how you impress girls. So I was excited to tell Mandy about my scars. And Mandy has some scars. Perhaps someday she'll tell you about those. I asked her about her scars. That's kind of a fun part of dating. She began to notice some different scars in me. Some scars that weren't quite physical. Scars that were below the skin surface. There's some emotional scars. There were some spiritual scars. There were some sin pattern scars. And we were getting serious. We began to talk about those scars, and she began to ask about those scars, and those dates weren't as much fun as the what kind of music do you listen to dates. She began to ask I've noticed that in these situations, you respond in this way. Why do you respond in that way? Oh, I felt a little exposed. She began to, uh, well, she came home to meet my family. And uh, we were both attending Canadian Bible College on 4th Ave. Uh, it's not there anymore. Now it's, there's Tim Hortons there. You can get a coffee. Um, we were attending there. And so my parents worked there and, I brought her home for dinner one time, two times, three times. She began to ask me about my family behavior. Why in your family does this always happen? When we get to a situation, the conversation could go this way or it could go this way. It always goes this way and the temperature in the room changes. The emotional temperature changes. Why is that? And the answer is, because if we go this way, somebody explodes. But if we go this way, nobody explodes, and it is far easier to go this way than it is to go that way. Anybody here have a family? Don't elbow the person beside you. Those kind of scars. She began to notice things about sin patterns in my life, in my family's life, some of them generational why does this happen? That's a sin pattern. Oh, those are exposing things, aren't they? But then I got her back. It was okay. I went to her family. <laughs> Look out. Went to the farm. Went into the farm and I said, hey Mandy, what, uh, what's with this? I don't get it because logically, scripturally, common sense says do this. But the family doesn't do this. It does that. Why is that? And we sort of deconstructed our worlds in front of each other. And we began to learn the truth about each other. And some of those things that I thought were really well hidden, some of them were even hidden to me, buried so deep, she noticed as she got to know me better. It feels a little bit like candidating. We started talking about, where's good coffee in town? But we transitioned from that. And we began to talk about, where are you weak? Where is the church weak? Did you know that there's weaknesses in a church? Not this one, but every other one. <laughs> you know what I heard about this church? Um, prepare, you're going to gasp. Do we have any oil to anoint people with? We do? Okay. I heard there are some leaks in the roof. I heard that. Matter of fact, I was here yesterday and we saw a, uh, one of the ceiling tiles bending a bit. It got fixed. There's a bowl on top of it now. It's not a joke. By the way, that's how I fix them too. That's, that's... There's, there's bumps and bruises. 
there's, uh, I'm looking up here at the carpet. There's a stain right there. You can come up afterwards. You can see it. Take a picture of it. There's little things. There's little stuff. There's patterns in every church. In the church that I serve in Kindersley, we do some things because it is easier to do those things than to deal with the ramifications of doing something different. And the tension is always when God says, I want you to do something different. And our response is, we hear you, God, and we want to obey, but can we pick a different Sunday? Because we don't want to deal with that on this Sunday. And then we have to come in confession to God. Uh, Sometimes we come in celebration. Sometimes we come in confession. We say, you've asked us to do something and we didn't do it. Has that ever happened? Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever been there when God wants you to maybe talk to someone and the reality is it's just easier not to? I I really have been there. And so we're dating. And we're learning about each other. And I sat with the board and with the ministry leaders and with the spouses and with people who were interested in dessert yesterday, and we did question and answer times. And some of it was a call for transparency. Some of it was really fun. There's a couple of questions that uh, I need to address here because some of you are wondering. Milky Way more than Dairy Queen, Dairy Queen more than Menchie's. Saskatchewan Rough Riders, Uh, I'm an equal opportunity guy, but I like old cars more than new cars. What else can I tell you? Coffee, black, and lots of it. I'm a snob, coffee, I plan on becoming more of a snob. I, uh, I really like good coffee, I'll drink anything, but I like good coffee. Those are some of those kind of questions were asked. And then there were questions about weaknesses. There were questions about how do we support. The questions were really about how do we church? How do we Rosewood Park if the Ralphs come? If this relationship goes forward, what does it look like? What do you expect? The question coming to me, for me to answer. What do you expect? What do you expect from us, from the staff? This was the question that they asked. The board has asked this question. Some people nervous because change is really difficult. Some people excited because change is fun and they thrive within change. Both represented here yesterday in those questions. It was good. It was fascinating. And we are, we are and were well welcomed and well questioned. I fell asleep in a second last night. Man, I pulled into the hotel, that bed felt like it was a mile away. The elevator took forever. We got there, boom, sound asleep. It was a big day. There's conversation all through Scripture from all different books and all different letters all through Scripture that talk not only about the church and what the church is, but talks about the scars within the church, talks about the historical stories of the church, and talks about what Jesus does with the church, what his intention is with the church, and what his method is. And if we read this, we get a picture of something that is not only church, but is so wonderful. I was just sitting there and I was listening to the story of the youth program here. And the request and the the, the invitation for there to be other leaders. I just want to say this. I, I really think if you knew what the church actually is, the problem would be we don't have space for all of the leaders. We don't know what to do with them. I mean, we would love for you to come. Literally, we have people to do everything. Okay, you're skeptical. I can see that. All right. We're going to work through this a little bit, and we're just going to see. Let's just see if I'm right. Let's just see if I'm close. In the book of Matthew, 
There's, there's a, uh, uh, we often will read this scripture on Palm Sunday, the famous Palm Sunday scriptures. And it's something that I want to read to you because I want it to set the base of everything else that we're going to read. I want it to be the, 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 the construction, the, the basement foundation that we're going to build on top of. So Matthew chapter 21, verses 4 to 11 um, I'm going to read this to you, and I'm reading this out of the NIV, uh, but um, follow along in whatever version that you have. Chapter 21, starting in verse 4. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Then this starts in quotation marks. It says this, Say to daughter Zion, See, the king is coming to you. I want you to hang on to that word king. That is, that's not a light word. They're not, they're not talking about Burger King. They're not talking about King Ranch pickup. King is something that when it hits the ears of the people who are hearing this for the first time, they know what is going on. They know what's being spoken about. The king is a very specific thing. And so when someone is called king, everybody perks up. See Your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is a remarkable uh, bit of scripture that, that we often call Jesus' triumphant entry. But all through my life, I heard about this triumphant entry, and I thought, the problem is, it doesn't sound like a triumphant entry to me. Everyone else must have it figured out, but I don't. Because it sounds like there's a guy on a donkey coming in. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches or palms, Palm Sunday, from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him, uh, there were crowds that went ahead of him, and those that followed, Hosanna to the son of David. Now, you've said king, and now you're saying son of David. Now, if you're Jewish, them's fighting words. Because we're waiting for a king who comes from the line of David. And you're saying this Jesus guy is him. So let's be real clear what we're talking about. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Sometimes in my town of Kindersley where I live, I send one of my children to go do something for me. And I give them my wallet, uh, as it is, a, a card or some cash. And they climb into my car And they drive to the business and they do my bidding in my name. They go into the business and they say, my dad says, I'm to do this. I want this. I want you to do this. And the business knows that when they talk to my children, it is the same as them talking to me. They carry with them all of my authority. They carry with them every bit of of instruction that I can give to any business. Come fix our boiler. They know that they're talking to me. And the imagery here, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Him is me, so says God. When he's talking about Jesus, riding on the colt, on cloaks, on palms, in a triumphant entry. At the same time that this is happening, on the other side of the city, there is another triumphant entry happening. And that is a huge, huge story. I'll just give you a little bit of it. It is a warning to other nations that the king is powerful. And we show the king being powerful because he comes in on horseback with chariots, with soldiers, with defense, And he triumphantly enters the kingdom. It's a warning. Don't mess with us. 
We're big, we're bad, and we are not scared to fight. That's happening at the same time. When Jesus comes in in his triumphant entry being called king from the line of David and God says, this Jesus guy is me as I as him. And it is a triumphant entry. It looks the same but different. That's a huge, huge story. There's more to that one. We won't have time today, but it's an amazing story. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. This is why. And they said, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. It's a wild story. It's a wild story. It is so much more than Jesus riding on a donkey. It is a triumphant, powerful entry done in the tone of Jesus. Modest, quiet, but oh, authoritative. The king from the line of David. <laughs> in 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 11, so uh, Corinthians are letters uh, written to the people of Corinth, and this is the second one. It's written by a guy named Paul. Something you need to know about Paul, Paul's a super intense personality. You read the story of Paul, he wrote much of what's in the New Testament. If you read the story of Paul and you read the writings of Paul, this is not a guy who goes to stand-up comedy routines. He does not have time for that. It is something serious and we got to do. He's type A personality. He's running there. We, what's the measurable matrix? We got to go, 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 go. And so he starts in chapter, in verse 11, in chapter 11, I'm sorry, he starts this way. I hope you will put up with me with a little foolishness. Now, if you know Paul, you perk right up because what's this? That's not in your personality. That's not how you do things. Foolishness. Put up with me with a little foolishness. Yes, please put up with me. I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. Who is he talking to? He's talking to a church. And he's saying, I'm jealous of you with godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband to Christ, that I may present you as a pure virgin to him. Now, in the culture that I grew up in, there's a couple of things that make me uneasy on this. Number one, I think I just got called a bride. Doesn't happen a lot to me. It's weird. It's weird. In this time, men are the ones who are counted. And yet we are talking feminine language. It's very interesting. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, that I may present you as a pure virgin to him. He is presenting the church, he is presenting the people within the church to Christ as Christ's bride. The church is engaged to Jesus, to Christ. And we are presented to him as pure. That means without blemish. That means without sin. That means without scar. It's quite a challenging verse, isn't it? It is to me. In Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 25, this is a bit of scripture. When I start reading this, I bet there are some people in here that just tighten up because this just doesn't sound like their reality. It doesn't sound what they have observed and it doesn't sound like what they want. And I want to suggest to you that we quit reading this too early and we have to read farther than we do. And so today I'm going to. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And how did Christ love the church? Well, he gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing her through water, through the word. 
and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Raise your hand if you feel like you are radiant, holy, and blameless. Go ahead, we'll wait. I'll keep my hand down. It's okay. You see, God is in the business of healing scars. God does God stuff with scars. One of the things that's fun, we are in our 23rd year of marriage. We, we dated for longer than that. But we didn't date longer than 23 years. We dated in addition to 23 years. Some of you were doing math. Where are you, Kevin? My scars are disappearing. You actually can't see a different difference on my hand today. There was a day when you could have. I'm going to have to show you some of the other scars so that you can find them because although it has taken a very long time, some scars are healing and my wife in our 23rd year of marriage is beginning to see parts of me without scar. Healed. Healed. This is a God thing. It took time. It takes time. I get to see parts of my wife that look like there wasn't damage done. I respond differently than I used to respond. As I was preparing for this sermon, I, I was asking my wife, <laughs> you got to be careful what questions you ask your wife. I was asking her, where are things that I used to do one way, but through the healing of the Holy Spirit, I now do them a different way? And she had a list. It came really quickly. <laughs> we were making the bed because Mandy likes the bed made. We were making the bed, and I was like, we got to hurry up this making of the bed because i got to end this conversation. She said, how you interact with people in authority over you changed. She said, you're not so quick to anger. There was a time when I was a firecracker. You're not so quick to anger, and you don't anger at the same things. You're easier to laugh. She said, you're exactly like your mom. And I said, is it the beard? Like, what is it? And my mom has no way. I love you, mom. It's a joke. <laughs> Things in me are changing. Things in my wife are changing. There are family sin patterns for generations that used to be celebrated as the identity of each of our families and now we're able to look at them and say these need to change and that's a God thing and we pray into that. God is in the business of healing and God is in the business of healing in his church changing his church from a flawed church with a leaky roof and a stain on the stage to a church radiant, washed, blameless, engaged to Jesus. Starts to sound like Jesus is the pastor of the church, doesn't it? To me it does starts pointing pretty heavily in that direction. You see, Jesus came to get a wife. He came to get a wife. The dowry was his life. Crucified on the cross, his blood run out on the ground by trained killers who are good at their job. They are practiced at their job. First they beat then they kill on a cross, much like this. And then Jesus takes the sword of death and pierces the heart of death itself and says, every knee will bow, including death, the king. He's coming for his bride. The day of my 
uh, wedding. I was very excited. I had a group of guys. We went out and did the guy thing night before. We all went back to, I lived in a, just about a shoebox in, in uh, Saskatoon. We all went there and everyone slept on the floor. We watched movies. We ate pizza. I think, I think we did that. Uh, <laughs> Heather and Wes Arickson have a son who's named Chris. And uh, <laughs> Chris got a hold of every clock I could possibly come in contact with and set them all forward an hour. This is back before your cell phone automatically connected with anything. So I got up when the alarm went off. I got ready and into the church I go, we're going to do a run through. We're going to do a whole bunch of different things. And then the guys are going to come and everyone's going to come and we're going to have a wedding. And I find myself standing at Lawson Heights Alliance Church in Saskatoon, the only person there banging on the door. Lights are off. Now, for those of you who have ever been a groom and been excited as I was, <laughs> there's a few logic things that don't occur to you. At least they didn't to me. But I had a deeply emotional response to it. I thought to myself, perhaps Mandy has come to her senses and has decided not to marry me and told everyone but not me because that would be awkward. Strange my parents didn't tell me. Legitimately thought that, banging on the door. Eventually, there's nothing to do but go for a walk. And so I started to walk down by the river. And come around the corner is the man who would have become my brother-in-law, except that Mandy has said no. And he rolled down the window of his car and he said, where are you going? I had no answer to him. And he said, you're supposed to be up at the church. We're starting in like 10 minutes. It's the best thing I ever heard in my life. Man, back up to the church, I've never been faster in my life. And there was, well, I didn't see my bride. She was inside getting ready. But I saw people. I saw those who were helping us put on the wedding. I saw those who would stand with me and for me. I saw those who would speak for Mandy. I saw my sisters. I saw my mom and dad. I saw Mandy's mom and dad. Oh, I can't tell you what that did in my heart. And Jesus is coming for his bride, and he intends to get her. He is the betrothed king. He is the person to whom one is engaged. He is intentional. And he looks to the bride, to you, to me with the excitement of a betrothed, engaged king. That is what God sees when he sees his church. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing her with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife as himself. After all, no one has ever hated their bodies, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ Jesus does the church. For we are members of the body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become flesh, and then we stop reading. And we miss the next verse. Here it is. This is a profound mystery. But I am talking about Christ and the church. You thought he was talking about me and my wife. He's talking about us and Jesus. Jesus. 
book of John, chapter 3. We're talking about a guy here named John, but you know how people get named after their job? Pastor Dan, Pastor Joel. This is John the Baptist. He baptizes. That's what he does. He lives in the desert. He eats honey. He wears animal skins. He looks weird. He smells gross. He lives in the desert. It's hot. He wears animal skins. You guys do the math on that. And he baptizes people. And people come from all over the place to be baptized by John the Baptist because if you want to be baptized, which stems directly from Judean spirituality, this, this act of cleansing, this, this act of ceremonial cleansing. If you want to be baptized, then this is the guy that does it. Nobody else does that. This guy does it. Come to John the Baptist. John chapter 3, verse 22. After this, Jesus and the disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Who's baptizing here? Jesus. Who does the baptizing? John the Baptist. Now we're all for this Jesus guy, but John the Baptist does the baptizing. Do you have anyone in your house that always cooks the turkey? How much of a fight is it if someone else cooks the turkey? This is not so far from our reality, is it? Do you have, do you have someone in your life that always drives? And then you see them show up and someone else is driving and you're like, are you okay? Is anything wrong? No, just the other person got in the driver's seat and they drove. That's not okay. You do the driving. That's not so far from our reality. Now John, the Baptist, was also baptizing at Anon near Salem because there was plenty of water and people were coming to be baptized. This was before John was put in prison. That's a whole other story and it's a good one. As an argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. Here's the argument. John does the baptizing. We set it up. We wrote it down. We printed it in the bulletins. There's nothing we can do. It's printed. It's a done deal. And Jesus is baptizing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, teacher. That's a, that's a word right there, Rabbi. That man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he's baptizing. And everybody's going to him. John the baptizer, what are you going to do about this? And they're expecting John to respond, let's put a stop to that. Send someone over to speak to him. Where's Harrison? Go fix this. There you are, right out the door. Go get him. To this, John replied, a person can only receive what is given to them from heaven, even if his name is Pastor Peter can only offer what is given to me from heaven. Can only offer what is given to John the Baptist from heaven. You yourself can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I was sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. Do you get the imagery? It is laced through scripture. There's a wedding coming, folks. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and there is and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. Then John says this, that joy is mine and is now complete. Why? Because he heard the voice of Jesus, the king, came on a donkey from the lineage of David. He is the king. He is the Messiah. He is the one who we have been waiting for, who the Jews have been waiting for, who Rosewood Park has been waiting for. He is the pastor. He is the real pastor. He has always been the pastor. He always will be the pastor. Perhaps I will be a caregiver. 
perhaps not. That's up to you to decide. But someone will be. And that caregiver will come. And that caregiver will go. But Jesus remains. He is the pastor. He was the pastor. He will be the pastor. John the Baptist knew it. And he said, I can only give you what God has given me. And my joy is complete because I have heard the groom. I have heard he to which all of this is about. And he's coming. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater, and I must become less. I want to thank you for the very, very warm welcome. Uh, Genuinely, sincerely. But this is not about me, and if it is, you should go. You should see the scars. They're everywhere. Some of them I even know about. Some of them maybe you'll tell me about. But Jesus is doing a work in me. And I suspect strongly, and I know, he's doing a work in you. And he's doing a work in this church. It is the same work he has done, and he has always done, and he will always do. As he changes this church, and first he heals the wound, and a scar develops, and then over time, the scar disappears. I don't know this for sure, but I bet you... Someone was upset when they got rid of the hymnals. I betcha. And it was a scar. And there was a Sunday when nobody mentioned the hymnals. And the pastoral team went, oh, it was the best Sunday ever. We didn't have to fight that fight. I betcha. Now this is going to date me here. But I'll betcha someone came up and flipped the thing on the overhead projector. And did it wrong. And if it was a young person like me, did it wrong on purpose where it was upside down and backwards. So you had to flip it around twice. And it only took about half the song to get it right. And everybody cringed. It was the wrong person doing it. Why can't we get Jen to do it? Jen always does it right. Do we have anyone here named Jen? (laughs) We got someone named Jen? Oh, thank you for doing the overhead projector right. I I was a pastor's kid, still am, which meant I wanted all the attention. So they made me fold the bulletins in a a, uh, room by myself. That is not my favorite thing. That's 100% true. That really happened. Rosewood has a pastor. Has never for one Sunday, for one moment, for one day, for one second been without His name is Jesus. He's betrothed. He's excited. He is in the process of healing and healing again and healing again. He knows what he wants his bride to look like. She will be dressed in white. She will be washed. She will be cleansed from all unrighteousness. And she will be fit for the king from the Messiah. I want to invite the worship team to come back up, and I have asked one of them to again read the verses and revelations that we read before. Here is my request to you. I ask that you close your eyes. I ask that you lean into the words that she is reading. It is Revelations chapter 19, verses 6 to 9. Hear these words. Hear them. If you've heard them a hundred times, hear them for the first time, and listen to what is coming. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteousness, for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this. 
Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God.